So thank you very much. It's wonderful be, to be here. And thank you all very much for coming over your lunchtime um, or sharing your lunchtime with me today. I'm actually working with Dr. Uh, Reza Rajab Zeda, and he's unfortunately unable to be here today. Now, I can't actually locate him at the moment. He was going to stop by at the very beginning, but for some reason he's not able to be here. So we'll come back to that in just a bit. Hopefully we'll be able to figure out um, you know, what's happened to him, Mac Duets. You'd hope they always be here. But today I will be talking to you about some of the stuff that I'm doing in my communications classrooms. So you heard me right. You heard uh, Aisha right, thank you. I teach communications to engineers, and I swear it's not a futile at, at, um, thing that we're doing here. I'm just kidding. Um, these are wonderful people and what we've been doing, and I'll tell you about some of the work that I've been doing recently with them, all around communications and more importantly, teamwork. So just to let you know what we'll be talking about today, I do uh, group work workshops. Now these are things that I've created myself. I have created uh, and facilitated materials before for training sessions, and these included for intercultural competency, which is actually my background as we heard. As we heard. So these are, are a little bit uh, within the same vein, we'll see. Um, I'm going to go over a bit about group work in general and then talk about the workshop design that you'll see. Um, I'll show, tell you about some of the secondary um, learning outcomes that um, I have for these workshops, which you'll see is in line with some of the other work that I've done in the past. And I'll show you some preliminary research findings. So as a LTL fellow here at McPherson, um, I've had the wonderful support and help of people that are uh, here amongst us. And they have been doing focus groups with my first years, as well as uh, we're doing surveys with second, third, and fourth years at the School of Engineering Practice and Technology. So I'll give you an insight on some of the preliminary findings that we have from that. And then I'll, let, I'll ask you if you have any questions and that kind of thing. Um, it is not 8.19, it is 12.39, so I'm going to try and end at 1.20 so that if people have to leave, they can. If anyone has any questions, they can ask me, but I've also brought a number of cards in case you want to uh, join up with me later, okay? So, what's the problem with group work? Well, apparently 85% of students have an issue with group work, and one of their biggest issues they have is the slacker teammate. And a slacker teammate is no good because they'll sit there, but maybe they're your friend or maybe they're your enemy, but there's something, somebody that will make your life that much more difficult. And the problem is if you are a, the vast majority of those students don't want to do anything about that. They say, hey, I'm cool with it. I just have a slacker teammate. It's just what group work is. And so people have these kind of mediocre expectations of what group work is. Sometimes you'll have people that are great and they have a bad semester, they have a bad project. So I think the vast majority, and this is what research has found, the vast majority of people try to do nothing about that slacker teammate. Only those students that are actually quite high achieving do anything about it. They're the ones that tend to be a little bit more proactive. And they'll go to um, other team members and say, hey, this isn't working out, you're not doing your work. But again, those are only the high achievers. The vast majority of students uh, sit there and take it um, with a slacker teammate. Um, what the research has found is that students are ill-equipped. Now, when I say research, the area that I'm looking at right here is engineering education research. And so what they advocated for is that students should be given more problem-solving skills, which I thought was a, as a non-engineer working in an engineering field, I thought was very engineering of them to be able to say, hi, let's work on more problem-solving skills um, to be able to find your way out of these issues. And so they advocate for a number of different things, but the jury is still out. Nobody has one single thing that they think is the best approach for designing or doing group work. And this can be problematic because there's a whole bunch, the, as I say, the jury is still out because they don't know uh, what things they would rather advocate for or give to these students. So here, I, the top five, I think, or six are here, um, but there's a long list. And um, so the vast majority do advocate that students are taught something about what the best practices of group work are you know, having a shared document or a shared communication system so that everyone can uh, communicate with one another. That's one of the ones that they would advocate for or they would do in this type of training session. They also have things like articulating clear objectives, and that's from the instructor point of view. So that's something that we can do as, um, uh, you know, tutorial assistants, as teaching assistants, as instructors ourselves, as coaches, as, as heads of departments. They also advocate that you t keep teams small between three and five. But it's, it's the jury's out as to whether or not you should let the students make their own uh, groups or whether you should make them for them. Because half the time, uh, it's, there's no real difference in terms of how well they do scholastically if you allow them to make their groups or not. Um, I'll I can, if you have any questions about how I do this in my own classes, you can ask me at the end. Um, if, we, if you, throughout the term, 
talk about and articulate the importance of group work, not just within the classroom, but in their fields, there tends to be greater student buy-in for the projects. And I don't know if anyone here has heard students or you know, been a student who has, I know I, had, I did, complained about group work, but there's a lot of, um, you know, why can't I just do this project myself? Can I just do it individually? And yet you're not learning those really, really important skills that you need for that workplace after you're done. Um, there's also stress points that happen, and if you see, this is negative situations I've picked up that has to do with, um, that has to do with, uh, I think, battery, whatever those are called, somebody can help me out, if the, I'm forgetting the terms right now, but um, this is negative situations throughout the semester. So at certain points, not to address when something actually happens, but to say, okay, this is after reading week, and we've done three small group assignments that work towards your larger group assignment, which is how I build my group work in my own uh, classes. And at this point in time, is anyone experiencing the following? And you bring up, you've got that one group member that has just been slacking off for the last two weeks. And how do you deal with it? And you give a best practice of how to deal with it. So it's not a sheet of paper you give the students at the beginning of the term. It's not a, okay, here's one uh, workshop class, good luck, see you later. It's what throughout the term can we do to keep that group work going. It's really if you keep the initiative going, it helps the students keep it going as well. So really, really briefly, and I don't have enough time to go through this in, my, in, in this class, unfortunately, in this class, in this uh, workshop today. But I have in my fall semester, so something you need to know about what I teach is I teach two courses uh, for first years at the School of Engineering Practice and Technology. For lack, you know, without getting into the details here, it's Communications 1 and Communications 2. So in Communications 1, students often learn about the business practices of, you know, how to write an email, a memo, a letter. We do that, seriously. It's actually quite good. Employers say it's great. And, um, and then we do three weeks of group work workshops. Okay? And that's, what, that's where these go. So what we used to have is a large group project. And this large group project used to have to be done on students' own time. And students produce typically mediocre results because we weren't giving them the, the, the strategy or the structure to be able to really succeed at this. And then we had them do a similar group project in the second term. So again, they were given more opportunity, more practice, and some um, scholars, I should say, advocate for this, learn by doing. But oftentimes, students would switch, so if they had a great group the first time, they might have a very difficult group the second time. And they hadn't been taught anything overtly. And to articulate those best practices is something that um, scholars have not been doing as much of. So something that I wanted to address here with this research. So in week one, this is now, this is week 10. So we do this 11, 10, 11, 12. It's also around a time that students are quite overloaded. They're starting to, you know, they're ending off on midterms. They're starting with those final exams. They're really starting to stress. So their cognitive load I can tell you, as the only management course in their first year, I can tell you which one gets the least amount of attention. It's mine. So what I did instead of having to do kind of the other kind of assignments, I had them do these workshops, and I gave them marks just for attending. Now, you think that perhaps might inflate the marks. It didn't. Our averages are actually just maybe two or three points higher than they used to be. And they would get up to 15% as long as they completed these workshops in addition to the self-reflection activities that were associated with them. 15% of their final mark just for showing up and participating. Now, not at the back of the room, I'm lucky to have only classes of 40, so I, I know every student by name, I can sit there and call them out and say, what about this, what about that? And it's getting, the activities that we use during these times um, are very interactive. So these workshops are built off my past experience developing intercultural competency workshops for, or diversity training, for lack of a better term, um, with employers or nonprofit organizations. They are heavily activity-based. Very little time is spent at the, begin at the top doing any kind of lecturing. Um, and so what we do each, for each one is we have a different focus, but they build on each other. So for the first one, um, they do an ITP metrics conflict management survey before they get to class is to help them understand what type of conflict management style they use. And we also address the conflict management style resolution techniques that they could possibly be using. So we focus on things like, who am I as a team member? How do I like to work? So when they come in, just as an example of the kind of stuff that we do, um, they come in and they, they haven't kind of seen each other before in this light. So we ask really simple questions and we get them to do just a really brief activity that would kind of warm them up. And then we say, okay, well, when would you, tell me what kind of, and I have them answer a question. 
And what we do is we start having people get into their groups as to associated by the styles that they found out from the survey. If students hadn't taken the survey, our little brief introduction activity allows them the time to do that in class, just in case anyone didn't do the prep work. So they get into their, their own sections and then we make them do a, um, a decision making or a brainstorming activity that has to do with group work. And what you'll notice is that certain styles inevitably tend to work better together than others. Then what we do, you know, you'll have ones that are, it's for lack of a better term, called dictators, <laughs> dominator, dominators. And they sit there and they yell at each other trying to get the answer out. Where you'll have the ones that want to acquiesce all the time, nobody can make a decision. So we sit there and we say, wow, you know what would be really useful? If you had a variety of different people within this group. And if the dominators could recognize perhaps that they'd speak a little bit more than they listen. Now this is of course a generalization. We use more articulate and nuanced um, things when we actually discuss it. But that's essentially the point we get to. Can you notice the value of difference? So this is the secondary learning outcome that we have for these workshops. And of course it lends back to the previous workshops that I've been doing. So it's kind of like, and I've been coming back to this term the last couple of days when I've been thinking about what I was going to speak about today, but it's like a spoonful of sugar helps the medicine go down, right? So if we're going to be teaching students about the importance of diversity, and not that diversity is not important, but sometimes it's hard to get students out to diversity training. Now this is another kind of tangent that I won't want to go on into too much detail, but in addition to teaching students about group work, why don't we also teach them about the importance of difference, recognizing it, but doing that through recognizing who we are. So who we are in relation to somebody else. So on the level, and we talk about this overtly, so it's not like I'm trying to you know, play a gimmick or, or have them not know what they're taking part in. It's really about group work, but group work you can only really succeed at by allowing other people's differences to help you succeed and to understand what your own strengths and weaknesses are. And that's what the whole first um, day is all about. The second day, uh, which is the following week, so we have in our classes, we have a three hour structure, two hours and then a one hour. So what we tend to do is we tend to do our reflection pieces built on whatever we, done in that, we had done in that class in the lab later on in the week. So they have time to do these written activities. And again, we're writing, which is great for communications. So it all kind of fits in. The second week, we talk about how do others like to work in teams? So it's not just about who we are. So the first week, one other activity that we do use that I wanted to mention was the Jahari window. And I get that from nursing. And so it's about understanding who, who we think we are and that there might be things we don't know about ourselves because we've never been pushed to that point yet or stressed out at that point yet. It's a really useful tool that um, if you want any more information about it, please ask. The second week we talk about how it's like to work with somebody else. And we do this through a personality test. That personality test, again, available through ITP metrics. Students come in and we do a sort of moon landing um, activity. Does everyone know what the moon landing activity is? You go to the moon, um, but you crash land and you only have 15 items. So your job um, is to identify which items you'd like to take by ranking them. And perhaps, you know, at the end of it, you find out you only have enough room for six or 10 or whatever it is, but you rank them in terms of importance. So we do that individually. Then we do it with groups that have similar personalities. And then we do it with groups that have divergent personalities. And we, we're moving around the classroom. We're doing these different things. And again, students are brought home to the point that diversity actually really quite works for them. And we bring this around full circle to say, well, how does this, and as we do with all these activities, how does this help you understand what your role in group work could possibly be? And so in doing this, again, we have another self-reflection activity, but this one's about creating a team charter. So a team charter is basically the rules and guidelines of how you'd like to interact with other individuals while you're doing a group project. And if anything happens, like you'd like to fire someone from your group, something that the literature said is actually quite positive in getting people to work and to be self-responsible. And so being able to fire someone, you have to articulate that in the team charter. Well, that's great. Um, but we learn about how to do that in one of those reflection projects that we do in the lab that 11th week. And so the final week, what we've been doing is we've been learning about best practices, the kinds of things that they could implement, in, including, and I don't have time to talk about today, the different tasks or roles that they can have, how to hand off leadership. We also talk about what uh, large industry leaders have done, like Google or any of these other places, about groups and project, man and project management, that kind of thing. And these are the ideas that we bring out until our final week. So from each week you learn about something and you bring that into the next week. So what I have here is what we do in our final week. Now this final week it's called a breakout box activity. And I don't know if anyone's ever heard of those before. But breakout boxes, if, well has anyone ever been to an escape room? 
yeah, I guess some nods at least know what escape room is. You're often locked within a, uh, a room and you're not allowed to leave um, until you find the clues to figure it out so that you can get out or whatever the case may be. And I'm still not allowed to lock anybody into any rooms here on campus. So instead, and this activity has actually been used or a tip, uh, one like it, it's called Breakout EDU. And it's been used in primary and secondary schools. But for them, there's a lot of stuff hidden around the room. And I don't think I could keep uh, you know, first year undergraduate students in, are really that engaged if I did it that way because I think you'd have a, maybe about five of them really engaged and the other 35 saying and, you know, it's just, it's not as much bedlam, uh, which I think you'd see in the, in the younger years. So what we do instead is we have 10 of these boxes in one classroom and I have five people to a group because I have up to 50 students, typically 40 but sometimes 50, so eight to 10 boxes. And what you have is an envelope on the outside and this envelope, you're presented with a scenario. Oh, that's terrible. The color is off. You can't see it. It's so beautiful. But maybe it's like, you know, we'll call it like artsy. Like this is what you're <laughs> kind of seeing, okay? What's next? Okay. So this is an example of what we did this year. So I'll just hold off on this and explain it to you. But what it is, is on the outside, you have a, an envelope. And the envelope has a series of uh, puzzles that you have to get through. And once you get through these puzzles, you're given the... Um, the lock, the combinations for these locks, you know, to get the lock, the lock off. And you think, oh good, I'm done, I win. And of course it should never be that easy. So you get in and of course you've got other puzzles that you have to do once you get inside. Yes, I know, it's exciting. And you're doing all this on a timeline. So what you see behind me is from 2017. Now this was, I'm, I was going to say, I'm sure everyone's heard of the zombie ant fungus. The zombie ant fungus, any biologists in the room? No? Okay. Um, <laughs> Kim's like, maybe. Um, do you know what, do you want to explain it? If it's what I've seen online, it's a fungus that gets in, in the ant and then it actually grows out of the ant. It's like a plant fungus. Yes, and it tries to make them walk back to their hill, so, or whatever it's called, I'm sorry, and this is not the biologist talking. Um, the hill, yes? No, the ant climbs onto a leaf and it hangs upside down, and then the thing bursts open and the spores spring and rain down all the other ants and affect them. Yeah. Sounds lovely. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> yes, so that happens. And that sounds frightening, doesn't it? Well, without using the word weaponize, um, my students are given a task, a scenario, and that's what you would see here. This is the scenario that they're given. This is from this year. But this is the scenario they're given is they worked in a lab because I have students from three different streams. The first one's biotechnology. So this is from a biotechnology stream. So they're trying to work on this, um, this virus to understand it better, and they realize that they're infected. Because they're in the room, they're not allowed any electronics, so they can't call out. And for whatever reason, they can't reach the outside. So they have to break into the box in order to you know, find the anecdote, antidote in order to get out. And this is them at the very end of it. So I, you can't see it very well, but they have goggles, face masks, um, dishwasher gloves, because you know that's as close as I got. They have uh, things on their feet, as well as painter's suits, and, and a badge that measured their, no, it didn't measure that, that was this year. So that's the kind of things that we're doing. So we're sitting there and they're really, really amped up. So I'm going to come to you with a problem in just a moment, um, because I often find an issue with debriefing this. Because the whole point of these boxes is to have the students experience or not, you're going to work in just a moment. Um, so this is the one that we had for this year. In addition to biotechnology, I also have a process automation engineering stream. And so this was about a nuclear plant whose core went dangerously high. So you'll notice I have things like um, a puzzle that has the uh, radioactivity sign on it and these kinds of things to get them in the mood. Periodic tables, which also bring in some of the stuff that they're learning in other classes. And again, their job is to break in and break out. And this one was to, uh, we had an extra added balance, which we'll see a little example of here today. So this is an example, a very poor two photos, which I'll send around the PowerPoint later. You can see the awesome photos, but of students working. Because what I found from last year to this year is that a lot of my puzzles had to do with language. And that would automatically um, be a negative or a detractor for individuals who are English as a second language or who have not grown up here in Canada. So this year I did a lot more puzzles that had less to do with um, knowing language. For example, um, you know, putting things on places and having to get a riddle and understanding the difference in the periodic table or uh, a puzzle themselves and finding the right number. So it had let to, less to do with language abilities so, to make it more of an equal playing field. And that's something that I did notice from last year. So, 
There are uh, assessment measures that are in place, and this is because, importantly, what the research has found is that um, in order to become a better team member, you have to be reflexive as to the kind of team member you are. What kind of weaknesses do you have? And if you have a strength, are you willing to speak up and say, you know what, I don't like how great of a writer I am, but I am an awesome presenter. So can you articulate that? And then can students not divide the work up like a pie? which is how it always is. And then so people are actually, students are actually grading their, if you have peer evaluation, they're actually grading students on their abilities to do, you know, be an overall complete student, which again, um, really helps some succeed and others not as much. So how do you do that? How do you make it a more equitable playing field? So there's a lot of reflection, if you'll notice in here, reflection, reflection. Um, we bring it all back together. And as I was mentioning before, and I don't want to spend too long on this because I see it the time already, is that a purpose of this is to understand the importance of difference. The difference actually um, breeds innovation and a better product overall. It's not easier, certainly not easier, and we talk about that. If you're comfortable, you're not going to come away with the best answer you possibly could. It's not going to get as far. Your ideas are only limited. And I have to acknowledge that within one of their five courses and in the following years, one of their six courses, they're not always going to have as best times to do these best practices. But if we can do something towards it in their future years, I think we've won, okay? We're going to be looking at perhaps how these um, different group work workshops uh, continue later on. So we're going to see if anyone still uses them in years three and four. So some promising practices that I found, I wanted to tell you what it is that I'd already um, thought was kind of working, and I'll tell you in a minute what I think needs improvement, um, is that I think it is a good idea to overtly teach best practices. I do. Um, what I'm doing in this semester, so you'll notice I have a very unique setup. I have, a first, I have a fall semester followed by a winter semester. And I teach four courses of the six. And all, all, all sections do get this as well. Um, but we model best practices within the second semester. So they have peer evaluation. They do a team charter. We give them time in class to do things. Um, we ask them. We check in. We tell them about overt. Um, you know, best practices, and we, we try to follow this because it's one of the few courses that will be able to do that. And then we say at the end of it, hey, this doesn't have to stop here. You can use this in your workplace when you have co-op in addition to the other classes that you have. Um, we focus on self-reflection because, again, it understands the utility or the usefulness of difference. We advocate for students to rotate tasks and roles because, again, we want to get away from that. Let's cut it up like a pie. You do the introduction, you do the background, you do this, and then we all present on what we wrote up. You know, students aren't really getting a holistic picture. And then there are efficiencies like, and here's the ITP metrics that I was talking about. Free program, serving your students. And what one of the most unique parts about it is, a lot of it is hands off for you. And they have activities at the end if you, if you want them to you know, self-reflect. Oh, and they provide you PowerPoint presentations if you want to debrief it. Like really, it's a, a wonderful resource. Um, and all kinds of great stuff. It's all automated. And for example, if you have a student group, as of, they can review each other. And as soon as the majority have submitted something, it'll produce a report back to those individuals where it would say, you do your self-assessment. I think I'm here, 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 here. And then your, your peers will say, oh yeah, well, you're here, 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 here. So on all these different measures. So it really lets them anonymously as well uh, get feedback on who they are and how they're doing. So if this is a Max Duet, Dumet's talk, I am missing an Amin. Now, Amin is my, my researcher uh, pal, my partner in crime. Um, we did this group work. Uh, we paired it with some of the software that he was doing in his second year and third year. We were also looking at deep level learning um, with our LTL fellowship. Um, but group work is something that brings them all together. And so unfortunately, he's not here today because he's locked in his lab. I actually locked him there because I thought it made it really be much better for this scenario. So what I'd like you to do now, because one of the biggest problems I have, as you know, is debriefing this activity because what they do is they get all amped up and they're super excited and yet once we get back they don't they don't often tend to work really well trying to connect the dots about what they learned and how it's good for group work or maybe they're just tired I don't know because I have them running I seriously do so what I'd like you to do now I'd like your help with this could you please look under the fronts of your chairs and under the front of your chair you have a letter And now I have, you've got stuff under your chairs as well. You're not getting out of it, just in case you thought you would. And Biliana, I don't think I got your chair. You're all good. Do you have it? I thought we did. 
chairs There's two chairs right here and one there. Oh, there you go. And so look under your chair and find the cue card taped underneath. Each, each card has one letter. Get into groups of 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 15. Okay, get into groups of five. That's awesome. And create as many four to five letter words as possible. But please assume you have a blank for that four letter word. Okay? Now the thing is, is that what you get into, it has to be a unique, um, a unique letter group. Okay? So if two of you have S's, you'll have to find a different group to go to. So please go to five. And if you can't find a group, I'll give you a different letter because we have some letters over here that aren't used. Oh, if you have a four letter word, just use that one, the blank, just assume you have a blank. Oh, that's nice. Okay? So if you can, again, this is the state of the art McMaster lab security lock and I've locked him in. So in order to get him out, if you want him to ever show his face again, please get into groups of five and somebody make a list of all the four to five letter words that you can create. And by the way, I'm sorry, but you only have about four minutes to do this. <laughs> do you all have different words? Yeah, you need five. L. So, Mama, what do you have? Okay. E. No. no. Switch the card. Switch the card. Switch the card. <laughs> on the front, on the front. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What do you have? Be a D, be a D. What are you? D. D. Oh, good. No, four or five. <laughs> you know what? We don't have as many, so let's do... Sorry, everyone. We don't have as many people here, so let's assume that you can have up to two blanks. So let's use three, four, or five. Okay, that'll... I think that helps us out a bit more. Blank a free letter? Yes. Oh, okay. Oh, no, no, sorry. Blank is a blank. So if you can have, for example, um, uh, oh, I don't know what that is. Yeah, you can have oil, and then the other two would be blanks after it. So that, no, it's not any word you want to use. Okay. Yeah. Raw. Raw, raw, sis, boom, ba. I get that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What about din? You know, like it's the the din of everything. It's really loud. Din is a word for sure. Din is a word for sure. Can we go French? I didn't say what language it had to be in. I guess Sylvie. I didn't say what language it had to be in. I didn't say what language it had to be in. <laughs> okay, I'm going to give you one more minute to 108. Oh, I said I was done. I was going to be done. Okay, so due to time, I'll bring you back just a little bit early because I did promise, and I'm totally going to break this promise, that I, no, no, 120 is when I promised, right? Yes, don't move yet because you're not done. So I see that it's not working. So what you can do, well, you've got, a, you've got some, you've some things, but I think we're a bit stalled. So what I would like you to do is choose to trade one letter to a, another group. So there's three groups here, so you can choose to trade one letter to each group. You can choose. Don't change a group member. Or, or, just one more point. Just one more point. Or, you can choose 
to stick to the group that you've got. And at the end of this, I'm going to say in about two or three minutes after you've decided whether or not you're going to switch, um, again, to switch is so that you can make new letters, new, new words, okay? So you can switch up to two letters, but one can only be with the other group. And if they decide not to share with you, you can't steal. At least don't, that'd be, that'd be bad practice. So the first group to submit a list to the mo of the most unique and recognizable words, a list of words will receive recognition from Patrick Dean for getting a mean out of his lab. Of course, I'll lose my job, but that's okay. Okay, so you've got until... If we Kim? create a letter, we have to give up the words that we've already No, you don't. Nope. Just create new ones. Okay? So as a group, decide if you want to switch, and then... I, with the group. With the group. It was only one per group. So if you've already traded once, you can't trade twice, just so you know. Only once. Only once. It can only be one per group. So the other group. You can, you can switch over here as well. You can switch once and once. Okay, you've got one minute left. So Sylvie, you've got one minute. I don't know. Are you open for uh, transactions or not? Sure. What do you have to sell or what do you need? Yeah. Well, no, it's a yeah. 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 Yeah.
I always do this, yes. Here's what I have issues with. Well, first off, how do you feel? What do we just do? <laughs> Group work. <laughs> and how did it make you feel? Somebody explain it to me over here as, this is getting intense. <laughs> Was it getting intense? Yes. Yeah. The communication, when I purposely started counting down, how did you feel? Stressed, Stressed out, All right? And so this is what we do. So difficulties with debriefing, and I put that in there because I start asking these questions. And there, I took, if anyone wonders where you get, I was inspired, this is not my brainchild, I was inspired by Scott Nicholson at Wilfrid Laurier University, and he has a games lab there, and they do a, an entire degree based on games. And I don't mean virtual games, I don't mean uh, programming, I mean actually physically creating games. And um, so I went to one of his workshops, and he does similar type things for a numerous different stakeholders. And I brought this to my classroom because I thought this worked just so perfectly because it built on each other. And you'll notice I put in, and this is something different from 16, uh, fall 16 to fall 17, is that it wasn't just you and your groups and how you were doing with each other, because that's one set of dynamics. But now I'm asking people that I've asked to compete to work with each other. And that's a lot like the university experience, the university context. And then we break that down. People start to negotiate. I saw Sylvie out there being the negotiator saying, what about this? What about that? You can't turn back. You can do this. It wasn't just Sylvie. It was lots of people in here, right? Like we're sitting there and we start to get a little bit nervous. We start to really all of our best practices break down. And so this is something that I'm still working on, these ideas, these questions. Because when I ask these questions, they kind of just, they deflate. They had this big experience, and you guys, this was just one kind of activity that I made you do. I popped on you, and I hope the surprise worked a bit, because that's also something. They're never expecting a box like this when they get into the classroom. So they go to this, and then I'm asking them. I'm back up at the front, and I'm saying, hey, what do you think about this? And everyone's like, oh, I don't care anymore. Come on, this is week 12. It's the week before. I have one, you're giving us an exam review next class. Like, that was fun. I'm really glad. I have to write a paper on this? Oh, crap. And by paper, I mean 250 to 500 words. Like, it's really not long. So how do I continue to work with this is something that I want to do. And can you guys give me any experiences? I know I've just kind of talked through it because I'm trying to look at the time, but what is your feeling about this working or not working, these kinds of questions? Like if I asked you, what happens to our best practices when we're under pressure? Could you either answer or tell me your thoughts on trying to answer that question, positive or negative? For me, uh, I was more like, okay, let's be you know, nice and gentle other, but then they're really, you just pops out when you're under pressure. Yeah. It's like you just can't hide it anymore. If you're a dominator, it's <laughs> you just get more proof of the stuff. We'll take that test, Sophie. We'll see, we'll see what you are. Um, <coughs> anybody else? What happens to best practices when you're under pressure? Or what do you think about trying to answer a question like that now? Right? Claire, what? I can see the eyebrows. I can see them working. Yeah, I don't know. I'm trying to think. Yeah. Absolutely. So it's about two and a half percent just to be there for their final grade, right? And so do they get, they are receiving something for it. Did you have your hand up? Yeah, I was thinking that when there's a little bit more pressure, you naturally notice certain people's strengths. Like some of us were avid Scrabble players, and so you could see that they were stronger. And so when there's a little bit of pressure, um, for me, I, even if you have like a competitive leadership quality, to their strength in that moment, it can actually help you. So it's a little bit of a reflective exercise to allow other strengths to shine when it's appropriate to you. Absolutely, and I did not pay her to say that. That was great. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and so what I tend to do is, this is from uh, Dr. Martini's work at Brock University, and this is the nutritional label. Now, I'm sorry, you probably can't see this, but what it is is I actually articulate what it is that students have learned through the workshops. So again, this is why I'm, a, I'm an instructor in communications and anthropology and not graphic arts, because I had to really work hard to make this. But self-reflection, total conflict management, uh, giving instructions, you notice it's really, really costly. A lot of calories go into this. Um, best practices and teamwork. And this is something that I give to them so that they can articulate this, for example, on a cover letter or resume. It's real skills that they can say, look, I've been through these workshops. Now, I haven't got them certified yet or anything to this extent, but perhaps that's in the future. Um, what I was working with John here um, is this idea of doing badges that they can then put in their pebble pad, which again, you know, We'll see, we'll see what July 1st holds, so we'll see if that's a project we can continue with. 
So we have done research, and in two minutes, let me tell you all about it. Um, <laughs> so this research includes, and I'll just focus on the ones that deal with the kind of the breakout boxes and the, focus, and the group work workshops. So we had wonderful people from here at McPherson come in and do uh, focus groups for us. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Malik, who is not here, was also a large part of that last year. And um, we, we talked to about 78 students. Now, what we do is we do two sessions of focus groups. We do focus groups week 13. So right after they've had their three sessions, I do an hour of exam review, and the last hour, because that exam review never took more than 45 minutes an hour. So I use the second lecture hour as a focus group time for this slot. So I give them pizza. This year, because we had money from the LTL Fellowship, we gave them, um, a, there was a chance they could win a gift certificate. So we got a lot of feedback. Um, this was actually from last year, because uh, we haven't done the output of the other ones yet. But then they come back, um, wonderful researchers come back in the winter and ask them, what did you use after this term in the actual practical application of the group work? What of the, of the skills did you use? And we don't preempt them. We just say, do you remember anything from last term? Did you use it? And then we say, aw, when they don't bring up a lot of it. So um, what we did do and what I'll, I'll have here is that a lot of students really um, loved the idea that these were low stakes environment to learn about something like this. Because oftentimes group work is only assessed as part of a large project, not in terms of articulating overt skills, which again was uh, what they thought was very valuable to it. And they appreciate the social aspects of the workshop, i.e. activities so that we didn't have to read the textbook, Jen. That's what I found. Okay. And when we asked about how competent do you feel to work in teams throughout the remainder of your degree, well, they all felt highly competent. Again, this is a self-reflection, this is self-reporting, so we understand that some may be more confident and whether or not that translates to skills or something else, but they feel more confident, which I think is half the battle when we're looking at being able to confidently say, these are my strengths, these are my weaknesses, this is how I'd like to proceed, no, I disagree with you. One part I forgot to mention, which I think is really important, is that we do, in our class with conflict, we talk about um, behavior, co uh, consequence, and feeling statements, or um, these statements that we actually articulate them, and we talk about, we even use examples, you know, for example, if somebody in your group says a racist joke, how would you respond? So again, talking about bringing this idea of difference and this idea, a, a difference in diversity and bringing this idea of group work together so that we have a more equitable and safe environment in groups. So what advice would you give to students? It's one of the open questions that we have. It's also one of the open questions that we have for our second and third years in, an op in our online survey. And so what we find, what advice is a really good way to say, well, what would you take away from it? What would you pass on? What do you wish you knew? These kinds of things. So I wish uh, uh, get to know other project uh, people and trust their abilities. Open oneself to diverse thinking. Learn, more, learn to be more tolerant. Uh, mitigate negative responses to others' opinions. Account for cultural miscommunications and appreciate diverse perspectives and feedback. So I have to say that I think the diversity part was really kind of icing on the cake. Sometimes it would help not the bow. Tie the bow, not the bow. Anyway, put the icing on whatever it was that we were doing, but it wasn't something that we spent significant time on. Instead, we spent significant time on skills, and then we would tie it back often to diversity. So the fact that these come out as our qualitative narratives from this experience, I think is really telling of the importance that that, actually, that role actually plays in going just beyond just learning how to be a good group member and learning about who you are, but appreciating difference, which I think is a, a, something that's really often hard to teach. So in the future, we want to, I want to continue looking into these three areas of self-reflection, this teamwork toolkit, which is what I want to um, eventually publish on in the coming weeks, or ye weeks, <laughs> i got to teach for a long time, I mean in the summer, um, and tolerance for diversity, of course, is something else that I probably want to do. Um, so if you want to, I want to thank you for taking part and having fun with me here today. I really appreciate it. I promise to let Amin out later and um, maybe sometime because uh, he was teaching at this moment in time so he couldn't be with us. But I want to thank you again and if you have any questions, this is my information, longgen.mcmaster.ca and uh, thank you very much for your time today.